Grace and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Kids, we have a few less of you this morning, but you can probably handle this question. Kids, what do you have to get through before the end of the school year that your teachers and your principals keep talking and talking and talking about? What do you have to get through? Okay, all the OGs, right? End of grade testing. And so, to get ready for those tests, what, what do they do with you? What do they have you do in class? Practice. Heard answer questions, study. Yeah. You do, you do some review. Now, kids, don't think because I'm talking about this that I'm going to hand you a test today, okay? No test today that I know for you. Adults, today it's your turn. You get the test. Here, let me get it out. I'm mm -hmm. just joking. Mm -hmm. We really haven't any tests that I have anyways. But a way that we could look at this last section of the, of the Bible, this last part of, of Revelation chapter 2, is as a wonderful review. And the importance of knowing the answers given here is greater than any test's importance. Now think about that. Tests, you kids, tests, your results may determine what, what schools you can get into at the next level. Tests, eventually, your results may determine what job opportunities you get when you're, you're done with school. But, but this message right here that we have from God Knowing this determines where our eternal destiny is. Whether we have eternal life with God or an eternity of hell. Apart from Him. Friends, it's, it's too important of a matter that is here before us to get occupied with other things so much that we lose sight of, that we forget to take time with this message of our God. So let's spend some time to, to review today and every day. So what do you do? What, what's the purpose of a review? It's stuff that you, you've probably heard before. I'm guessing as we look at Revelation 22, many of you will have heard the truths here before. But in order to make sure that you've got all of them, it's in order to make sure that you've got all of them straight and clear, you, you review. And if it's a subject that you, you love to study, then it, it doesn't become work, really. It becomes... A joy. That's what we have before us here as we take a look at Revelation 22. Let the words soak in and then we'll take a look back through them. Look, this is Jesus speaking. Look, I am coming soon. My reward is with me. And I will give to each one each person according to what they have done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. Blessed are those who wash their robes. They may have the right to the tree of life and may go through the gates into the city. Outside are the dogs, those who, who practice magic arts, the sexually immoral, the murderers, the idolaters, and everyone who loves and practices falsehood. I, Jesus, have sent my angel to give you, that's a plural you, to give you this testimony for the churches. I am the root and the offspring of David and the bright morning star. The Spirit and the bride say, Come, and let the one who hears say, Come, let the one who is thirsty come, and let the one who wishes take the free gift of the water of life. I warn everyone who hears the words of this prophecy, of this scroll, if anyone adds anything to them, God will add to that person the plagues described in this scroll. And if anyone takes words away from this scroll of prophecy, God will take away from that person any share in the tree of life and in the holy city which are described in this scroll. He who testifies to these things says, Yes, I am coming soon. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. The grace 
the Lord Jesus be with God's people. Amen. Let's say a prayer as we get started. Lord, as we study your word, impress ever more deeply and richly into our hearts and minds the answers to the most important questions of life. Increase our appreciation not only for your message, but for you, the giver of that message, and all that is true and good. And then strengthen the grip of our faith with which we hold on to your lasting treasures so that we never lose them. Amen. Our first review question, then, to be answered in our verses is, is very central. It is the center of Scripture. What is the way to have eternal life? Or how am I saved? As we answer this question from the words here in Revelation chapter 22, there are a couple of principles, the, the rules that we follow to understand the Bible correctly, that I want to throw up before you. You've probably heard some of these before. No part of the Bible will contradict another part. If something is said in one place, it'll agree with everything else throughout the Bible. The Lord tells us His Word is flawless. And so, it makes sense then that we follow the second principle, that we let the Bible explain the Bible. Sometimes you hear, um, let Scripture interpret Scripture. In other words, when there's a part of the Bible, maybe a passage or a phrase, that's hard to understand, we turn to the rest of the Bible to make sure that we're understanding it straight and, and correctly. Now, I put those out here for you at this point, because right away in verse 12, as we get into our verses, there's a, a statement that with, if taken in the wrong way, out of context, someone might get the wrong answer for our very first question. When Jesus says, I will give to each person according to what they have done, does that mean that we have to do something in order to earn eternal life with God? And the clear and the emphatic answer from God's Word is, no! How do we know that? Well, let's go back up the slide real quick. No part of the Bible will contradict any other part of the Bible, and we let the Bible explain the Bible. So to do that in this case, let's, let's jump back to verse 12 to start with. What in verse 12 indicates that we're not saved by what we do? You see anything? Jesus says, My reward is with me. His reward is not something we earned. It is what He earned for us through His perfect life and His death in our place. Isaiah 40 in the Old Testament, look at, look at the connection. The Savior is spoken of, His reward is with Him. And in that same section of Isaiah, the Lord goes on to say, I am your Redeemer, I save you, I and only I am He who blots out your sins for my own sake, not for the sake of anything you do, and remembers your sins no more. So, Let's spread out from verse 12 as we go back to Revelation 22. And let's see in other places in these verses signs that we are not saved by what we do, but by what God does for us. Turn to verse 17, and you see the Spirit's message, that's the Holy Spirit, is come and take the water of life which is given to you freely. It's, it's free to you. It's gratis, right? What do you have to do or pay in order to get this? Nothing. It's a gift. And then look back to verse 14 and see, see the description of those who have received this gift. Blessed are those who wash their robes, that they may have the right to the tree of life and may go through the gates into the city. Have access to the tree of life and access into the city. This is talking about eternal life, just like the water of life. That's, that's eternal life given by Jesus. And notice about this group. Everyone in this group is described as doing what? Washing their robes. Now that's a picture for something more than clothes, right? That's the picture of, of understanding, admitting our daily sins that stain us. 
And it's tied with recognizing and trusting that it's only Jesus that is able to wash those sins away. Earlier in Revelation, we heard the section in chapter 7 where it says, These are they who have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. So that awareness, that admission, confession of sin, and a trust in Jesus as the, the way to have sin forgiven, that is the thing that separates us believers from those who are left out of eternal life with God. In verse 15, we're told about that group that's apart, separated from God. And as we take a look at that description of those who are left out of God's kingdom, not given entrance, note the different sins that are, are mentioned in the list, at least some of them. Sexually impure acts. And don't limit this just to those who cheat on their spouse. Or to those who who, in their lust, hook up with whoever they want. Jesus says anyone who has lusted after another person has committed adultery in their heart. Every impure thought about God's gift of sex and sexuality is sin. And you go on, and idolaters. Don't just think of people in other nations and other cultures who fall down before a Buddha or who pray to a Krishna or who, who follow superstitious practices like worshiping the, the spirits in nature, or worshiping their ancestor spirits, because anything in life that gets more importance than God becomes an idol. We make idols out of our money. We make idols out of activities. We can even make idols out of our spouse or our children. In fact, we can make idols out of, we can become our own idol. If our will and our reasoning is placed above God's. Failing to give God the love, trust, and honor he deserves is idolatry. And, and then, who love and practice falsehood, lying. We shouldn't deceive ourselves into thinking there's such a thing as a little white lie. Or that the lies that we tell don't really hurt anyone. Everyone has to take a look at the things described in verse 15 and admit we are guilty of these sins. So what distinguishes then those who are welcomed into heaven from those who are left out of heaven in verse 15? Well, no one is excluded from God's invitation to have the gift of eternal life. The only ones left out are those who will not admit their need or who will not turn to Jesus as the source of forgiveness and life. Basically, those who lie to themselves, and even lie about God, that God really doesn't mean what he says when all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. He really doesn't mean what he says when he says Jesus is the way, and there is no other. Admit your sin and trust Jesus to wash that sin away and to be your way to eternal life. So we come to, to have our first answer. And, and as we finish up with that first answer, the thought comes to mind, how important do you think it is to be alert to people bringing a different message than this? Even, even while they're saying, hey, I've got something that's from the Bible. The devil, the, the father of lies, loves to... To, to twist Scripture, to take some of it, to take, to take it out of context, and to spew forth from his mouth something that is completely poisonous. He has a, a lot of people in the world, popular people, to peddle his poison to. Even in the first couple of decades, after Jesus' ascension, as these New Testament books were being written down, there were attacks directed right against the Christian individuals and Christian Groups in different places. One that we're told about is that groups are coming and telling up the, the Christians that they need to do something, they need to contribute in order to get to heaven. Galatians, the book of Galatians answers that. Another one, there, were, there was another group that was coming and saying, questioning that Jesus was truly and fully God. In Colossians chapter 1 and 2, you'll find verses to address that attack. And that really leads us to the second review question that's contained in our verses. 
who is Jesus Christ? And how does who he is meet our need? Did you realize the creeds that we speak in our services, the, the um, apostles and the Nicene, and sometimes we do the Athanasian, that they were largely written in response to attacks on Jesus' identity. Now, don't think, oh, well then, that was dealt with long ago. And I don't, need to, I don't need to concern myself with such thoughts. Because you know how many attacks there are today on Jesus' identity? Have you heard this one? Have you heard the one where people say, Jesus never even claimed that he is God? Ever heard that one? There, in fact, it was a highly paid, highly sought after speaker and writer, New York Times bestseller author, and that's just, his, that's just his night job. During the days, he lives right up the road on I-95. He, he, he's a, a professor at the University of UNC, um, campus, and he's in the religion, uh, religious studies department. He can, he's consider, he's considered a New Testament scholar, and he goes around telling whoever will listen to his lectures or whoever will read his books, well, here's a quote from him. During his lifetime, Jesus himself didn't call himself God, and didn't consider himself God, and none of his disciples had any inkling at all that he was God. Now, you might guess that someone in his kind of position would make their case sound very educated and very reasonable. What if someone who reads his book or listens to his lecture comes to you with this thought and, and tries to tell you to follow this? What do you have treasured up in here and up here so that you won't lose the ground on which you stand, faith in Jesus? The devil is a master at appealing to our human reason. The devil loves to throw out the thought to you, you should listen to your own thinking rather than what God says in his word. So, here's an important principle to keep in mind along with the two that we already covered. The principle that we always let, we always put God's word above our human reason. We're all in agreement, right, that God knows more than us. Yeah, and we've already covered the thought that, that God's word is 100% trustworthy and true. And we know that God can do more than we can comprehend. So, so look at what Jesus claims about himself here in the last chapter of the Bible. In verse 13, first of all, he says, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. Think of what he is claiming by saying that. He is saying, when... Everything else was not, not in existence. I was there. He's making a statement. I am eternal. So he is saying, I am God. He again identifies himself as God in verse 16 as he says he is the root of David. So think of a timeline here, timeline here to put it in perspective. David was between like 1000 and 900 BC before Christ. Christ's birth in Bethlehem. And, and so now you've got this statement that, that Jesus is really David's source and David's creator. He is God. And yet in the same breath, what else does Jesus make the statement of? He says, I am also the offspring of David. So, at just the right time in history, after, you know, we got David over here, and you got where God the Son becomes flesh. He comes in order to carry out the work to save us. He's knit together inside the, the womb of Mary, a descendant of David. And so he is at the same time both true God and true man. Now, Jesus taught this same truth during his ministry. Don't let anyone convince you that Jesus never taught this very same truth. Don't let anyone think that, that John came up with this later, and it was written at the end of the Bible because John... John decided this, not Jesus. Jesus, in Matthew 22, in talking about the Christ and the prophecies of the Savior, said, he's the one who is a descendant of David, right? And all of the teachers said, yep, he's a descendant of David. Then how can he also be called David's Lord? He is the Lord. 
And yeah, that's exactly what the Old Testament says. He is our Lord and God. So he is at the same time both true God and true man in one. And this is all wrapped together with our first question. How are we saved? He meets our needs. In Hebrews we're told, He had to be made like us, His brothers, in every way, in order that He might make atonement for the sins of the people. But if He was only a man, it wouldn't be the, the, the work needed in order to rescue us. That's the case that Psalm 49 makes. And then Psalm 49 goes on to say, But God will redeem my life from the grave. He will surely take me to himself. In other words, God will make the payment in order to take my sins away and to give me eternal life in heaven. You see how important Jesus' identity is. If he is not true God, then he, he doesn't make the payment for all of us and, and we are left in our sins. If he is not true man in our shoes, then, then we are not rescued either because he hasn't been our substitute. But he is true man and he is our eternal God. Now here's the thing. Now that we got those two answered, what do you think will be the devil's next attack? If we've got these two answers soundly in place, can you hear his next appeal? Right. Right. There are certain truths of the Bible that are certainly non-negotiable. But when people fall into errors about less important teachings of the Bible, we should just let some things go. Those who are, are sticklers about every teaching of the Bible, they just divide. They just cause all sorts of problems. Now, do you see the tricky point in this devilish line of thought? Who is it that is speaking such comments? It's coming from within... Christian circles. How would you answer the claim from someone who, who professes to be a Christian, and they may be, but they say, well, we all believe in Jesus, so what difference does it make if, if some among us don't believe that, Jesus, that God created the world in six days because they want to follow the ideas and trust the ideas that scientists are telling them? that life evolved up over millions and billions of years. Or someone says, is it that big a deal if I don't believe that Jonah was swallowed by a big fish and spit out later, alive, three days later? It sounds too impossible to me. So this is the kind of things people will say to you, but what, what does God's Word say about this? My third review question answered today is, how dangerous is tampering with God's Word? with the Bible. In order to do this, I'm going to have whichever kids I can get to, I have little kids that will volunteer to come up here, or, or older kids, I might have to do older. You can get any. Soul will come up and help. Maybe we'll bring Petrus up. Mm -hmm. You're going to get Axel? Maybe. Mm -hmm. Come on, come on. You can help me out. Okay, so, what we're trying to see is, in these verses, God tells us, don't add and don't subtract to God's Word, to the Bible. So you're going to need some help with the, the older one here to read this for us, but then after that, the younger one, one, ones can help me. So we're trying to see how much a message can change with just little things being changed. Okay, what does it say? Sing a lot. Sing a lot. Sounds good, right? Sing a lot to God. Praise God. Sounds good. Okay, now let me have one of you. Effie, do you want to help me? Come here, and I'm gonna take your hand. I'm gonna put it. I'm gonna put it in front of one of these one of these letters right here. Okay, and you hold your hand right in front of that letter. There you go. Now, what does it say? Sin a lot. Sin a lot. <laughs> Do you see? All we did was change one letter, cover up, take away one letter, and all of a sudden, you sing a lot. Would you do that? Sin a lot. You want to do that? Well, no, of course not. Let's let's get another example. Okay. Someone else can help me. All right. What does it say for us? Learn my love. Learn my love. God, of course, says, learn about my love, right? Okay, who's going to help me here? Patrick, you want to help me? Come here. I'm going to take these two sides, and we're going to tear it. We're going to tear it, okay? And we'll see what happens. All right? Go ahead, take it.
Okay. And now, they're taking just away a tiny bit of the message, but what does it say? Um, does God ever tell us to earn His love? No, that would change the whole message. We heard again today. This is a, a free gift, the water of life, eternal life, given freely through Jesus. This, this has no place in the Bible with just a, a small change. And what about, that was taking away in both cases. What about if we add something to God's Word? Does the same thing happen possibly if we, if we make little changes? Okay, what does it say? I ate a lot. Well, of course, if we get together with family at something like Mother's Day or Thanksgiving, maybe when everybody brings something, you'd say, well, I ate a lot of good stuff. It was nice of people to bring that. All right? Ah, Axel, you want to help out? Come here. Okay. We're going to take this and we're going to put it on there. We've got to tape it on there, right? Right there. Okay. All right. That's, that, that's what we did. Okay. And now it says... Um, you don't want to walk back from that family gathering and say about the people there, oh, I hate a lot of them, right? No, of course not. That, that's a huge difference. Okay, you kids can sit down. All right, listen to, to our point here. Go ahead. Go back and sit by your mom. Okay. Right. <laughs> the point. God doesn't take any changes to his word as insignificant. Why? He explains that error and false teachings are like gangrene. They, they do harm. And they, they grow. That, that's what they, they do. So they're always deadly dangerous to our faith in Jesus. He says to us, warn those who are doing this, who are adding and subtracting to God's Word. And don't join with them. In fact, he says to separate from them. Separate from the influence of that false teaching. Why? Because God loves you. Because He doesn't want your faith affected by a false teaching that does it harm. And because God loves them. And He loves others. And he doesn't want us, by our acceptance or our support of what they're teaching, to give approval and point people to a, a message that has false teachings. God's love is behind all of this that he tells us. And that leads us then to just our final review question today. What comfort does God leave us with? What is the subject of the last sentence of the Bible. The grace of our Lord Jesus. The grace of God. The undeserved love of God. Is with you. Dear child of God. Through faith in Jesus. His love is with you. May it continue to remain with you. The Spirit says, come. Are you worn out? Are you tired from your, your daily battle with temptation and sin? The Spirit says, come. And take the water that I freely give you. The water of life. Bring all your guilt and sin. Are you thirsty for the righteousness that you lack and the righteousness that Jesus alone gives? Then, then come and keep on thirsting and having your refreshment from this news, Jesus gives forgiveness and life. Amen. Now may the grace of God, which surpasses all understanding, guard and keep your hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen.